I'm going to put the agenda and materials in the chat. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending uh, this evening. Um, uh, this is uh, a meeting of the CBRC uh, the co uh, Community Budget Review Committee. Um, uh, I, I like to uh, spell out uh, acronyms, and that's why I mentioned our name in full. Um, so uh, uh, I, I need to click on the agenda so I can see what, what we're to, to talk about. Um, uh, first off, uh, I, I uh, have been asked to uh, uh, ask you to confirm your attendance at the joint meeting with the board on March 14th, uh, and if you have any dietary restrictions, uh, gluten-free, uh, vegan, et cetera. Um, um, so, um, uh, you can uh, uh, confirm that with Jordan, and um, and uh, and please do so immediately, so he can relay that to the board secretary. Um, um, Roger, can I add to that real quick? Sure. I'm uh, just so everyone knows. I'll I'll email you right after this meeting is over um uh with those with those questions whether you can attend and what your dietary restrictions are just please feel welcome to um to respond to that please respond to that email um whether you can attend or not um but yeah thank you so um last uh, meeting uh, we uh discussed a a, a few preliminary uh questions and um, um and um uh i don't uh uh, off the top of my head, recall uh, what those questions were. Uh, but uh, if individuals would like to uh, refresh our memory and um, um, and bring them to our attention now, please do so. And Jordan will let us know who's raised their hand, uh, as I can't see that on my screen. In uh, Roger, I'll also uh, just quickly chime in. Um, it's, it's, as we've collected questions from the past uh, few meetings, we've been logging them. And um, Jordan, we have on our Google, uh, I don't know what to call Google Sheet. It's not a Google Sheet. It's like a, our, our CBRC website, Google Drive website, where we have a link to Q&A. Um, we've been answering some of the questions. I just don't know yet if they've been updated, um, but there's also a log there, I believe, from previous conversations. And um, as, as we work through, because it's not, it, it, it's definitely a, a team effort to get some of the questions answered. And as a few folks are in and out of the office, we're working to make that happen. But um, there is a log where we have them. So just you know, for the sake of some folks may not necessarily recall if they had a question uh, that that we do have that log. And I'm recognizing that I'm frozen, but I I hope y'all can still hear me. Um, nonetheless, um, thank you, Mariah, for, for for putting the link there. Yeah, I haven't. Um, we have a few new. Um, questions with answers that have not been updated in that log yet, but I will copy and paste those in there um, tonight. Okay, Jordan, um, uh, maybe you need to refresh uh, uh, the committee's uh, understanding as to how to log on to the, the portal where that is found. Yeah, um, so the the portal um, link has been sent to you in an email and a few emails, but also um, I link it in the agenda um, each meeting. So at the top of the agenda, you'll see two links, the meeting link and the member portal. Um, I Every time I send you a reminder um, of our upcoming meeting, I, I try to link the portal in that email um, and also in the agenda that I send you. So um, you can always kind of find it in those places, um, but I highly encourage um, you to um, make a bookmark of the portal um on your your own computer if you can um but yeah and of course if if you can't find it you can always uh, message me or text me or something and i'll send it to you 
Okay, I just tried to click on the link and it didn't let me do that. So, <laughs> is anybody else having trouble clicking the link into the portal? Or if you are, you can let me know. But um, I don't get the little it. hand thing that uh, shows on screen. It it just shows the cursors up there. Okay, let's see if I can help you fix that, Roger. Okay. Uh, oh, there it goes now. Okay, thank you. So, um, are there any updates from the group? I, 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 um, I personally uh, uh, had, had informed uh, 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 Jordan that uh, that I would be submitting some questions. Uh, but I have not done so yet, and um, um, I, I hope to get the, to that tomorrow. It's been a busy day for me. So, um, uh, but uh, if there are any questions that other committee members have, uh, please um, uh, submit them, and um, um, and uh, the staff will do their best to uh, get us answers. <clears throat> So if um, um, we're very close to uh, 5.45 and uh, the presentation by Dr. Kimberly Armstrong is the chief academic officer uh, is our presenter this evening. And uh, if uh, there is no other questions, uh, let's move ahead and ask uh, Dr. Armstrong to join us. I have a, I have a couple of questions or I think um, Maria is before me though. What's that? We we there's a couple of questions, but there's somebody before me. Oh, Mariah has her hand raised. Mariah, Mariah, Thanks. sorry. Either way, yeah. um, I just wanted to mention that um, it might be of interest to the group that um, uh, Governor Kotek has released. Um, her budget proposal. I mean, that's not necessarily what's going to uh, make it through the legislature, but it kind of gives an indication for education priorities. And I thought that was interesting. So I'll just, I'll pop that link in the chat for anybody who wants to see it. And thank you, thank you for mentioning that. Uh, you know, the governor proposes a budget and uh, the joke in Salem always is it's dead on arrival. Um, I, I noticed her proposal is $9.9 .9 billion for education. Uh, how that factors out uh, uh, will rely on staff to, to inform us as to what the actual figure is to, to maintain uh, current effort. And uh, um, uh, last go around uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the edu education experts were t saying that they needed 9.6 and uh, the, the legislature appropriated 9.3. So. Um, so thank you, Mariah, for pointing that out, that the governor has submitted her budget. And, and, and I'll just chime in uh, that um, leading into this upcoming budget cycle, the, the current uh, service level, so kind of like the minimum that the Oregon districts and advocates feel that we need to mitigate disruptions and just kind of kind of keep the current service level is ten point three billion dollars, yeah. and and so it's a, it's a billion dollars more than the last biennium, and so with the latest uh, um, conversations over the past few days regarding the governor's budget, it's 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 right. It's a it, it, it's a proposal, and right legislatures then kind of get into. Uh, the, the converse deep into conversations to see where we where we officially land. So definitely, it's early in the process, and and we're going to continue to to um, you know push forward towards the superintendent's uh, proposed budget come April twenty fifth. Well, thank you, Berto, for that information, and um, I'm not surprised that. Uh, uh, we're below uh, current. Uh, our, the proposal is below the level that uh, would that are that we're estimating. So, um, 
Roger, so, uh, Karanja's hand is up. Yes. You know. Okay, I can't see that. So, uh, Karanja, would you please uh, contribute now? Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted some clarity before we jump into the agenda. Um, uh, to my understanding, we are we review budget, and so I was trying to figure out what was the purpose of the presentation that's going to happen next with the instructional framework. Now, is this going to be a particular budget ask? Is that the reason why we're having this presentation? Is, is it something that's going to be included in the budget? So I'm just trying to get a framework and understanding um, for the presentation. Well, go ahead, Berto, if you want to answer. Sorry about that, Roger. Forget we have a chair now. I know Berto doesn't need to do all the talking. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll quickly chime in. Karanja, thank you for the question. I think it's important to frame the conversation and, and really as CBRC's goal uh, or, or objectives is to review the superintendent's proposed budget. So as a proposed budget gets gets presented at the end of April, there's going to be investments and, and, and um, to continue to push forward with meeting board goals, with uh, uh, aligning with the strategic plan. And so Dr. Armstrong, Armstrong is here today to talk about the instructional framework and as it, 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 as an important, um, because it's an important investment that the district is pushing forward, and there's resources, people, time, and, and, and money and effort that go into the instructional framework as a core tenant of our strategic plan. And so I think as CBRC, it's like, it, it, it's, it's background information is to help build a foundation around one of the core uh, tenants, uh, which we build the budget around. And so Dr. Armstrong will uh, tell us all about it. Uh, it, it, it. Full transparency. It's like, you know, there's so much information that we can talk about it for days. Uh, and we know we have uh, a limited time today, but it's to help build that context. So when the superintendents propose budget, there's some uh, through line to this investment. Is there an idea of how much he wants to spend within this framework? Because uh, it's a big chunk of our agenda. And I'm, I was under the under, understanding and impression that we're going to review like numbers and review budgets and allegations and things like that. So, um, it, but just getting information, but, you know, I don't know. I, I feel like maybe was that presented in a board meeting or? I'm just trying to get some more understanding because I'm new to the committee, so I'm right, still learning. Right. Yeah, so to help level set, it's not necessarily reviewing line items. So CBRC is not going to be reviewing, oh, you know, maybe you should move over $20 from this expense over to this other expense. It's it's it, it's really like thinking about the themes. It's a 500-page budget book and, and really calling about, calling through uh, themes regarding uh, investments that there, there may be a specific dollar associated with it, uh, or there may be different uh, funding sources that are still being developed. And as an example, in this year's budget, the first uh, few pages contains the superintendent's message, budget message, and it lays out key investment areas. And so that's like an example of, uh, of taking information from this uh, hundreds of pages of, of compliance documents into um, key points around investments being made. Some of them have clear through lines on how much, but uh, really thinking about is, is the how much, but also the how well are we aligning to the board goals or how well are we communicating not just a dollar of an investment, but the intentionality of an investment to support the board goal or support the strategic uh, outcome. So if, if we were having a conversation around um, items that just we CBRC feels like, how is that supporting fifth grade reading? Or how is that supporting our black and native students from meeting the board goals of gaining uh, and, uh, there's these different percentage points over time that those would be areas to raise. 
Uh, and there could be other areas that CBRC may feel like, you know, there isn't enough about X, Y, Z that uh, we see in the superintendent's budget. Last year, um, the committee brought up, um, uh, I believe it was like custodians, Roger, as an example uh, of like some area where there wasn't enough call out that that CBRC brought that to the board's attention. But uh, Roger, and, and um, I'll stop talking there and let you, you know, if you have more to add, uh, being a CBRC member for much longer time that I've <laughs> been around, uh, I, I welcome any additional feedback. Well, well, I think the simple answer, Kanja, is that uh, we're trying to expand our knowledge as to what the job is that a school district has uh, that confront, it, 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 it confronts uh, uh, on an annual basis. And uh, the, we'll get the specifics uh, once we get a proposed budget in our hands. That comes later. Meanwhile, while, while we're preparing to receive that, we can expand our knowledge as to uh, what the work of the district is. Uh, for example, Historically, we've gotten briefings on special education, on English language learning, um, um, just as, uh, as two examples. Uh, there are many, many others. And, uh, um, uh, and uh, in previous years, uh, the work of this committee has begun way back in September. And, and so by the time we receive a budget, uh, we're, we have a wealth of knowledge to, uh, upon which to, to uh, base our work uh, in evaluating uh, the proposal as it relates to board goals and so on and the vision. So, but, but okay. I, I, so I, I, I was conscious that we are past the time that we have promised Dr. Uh, Armstrong to present. And so could we please move on? Okay, well, welcome. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me into your space. And um, I know we planned for me to talk for about 15 minutes and then open the questions. I think I can still um, get in what I what I need to get in. So let me do I share my slides? Or is that? Um, do I share them, Norberto? I, Jordan, does uh, Dr. Armstrong have sharing? If um, yeah, if you, you, if you, I can also share for you if you'd like me to, but um, I'll let you decide. But I did open the share setting so you could share if you needed to. Okay, no problem. I'll share and then I will, um, we'll have time for, um, for questions at the end. All right, well, for together, as you know, that's our theme. And I'm excited to be here and, and share with you the work that's happening in the Office of Teaching and Learning. My name is Kimberly Armstrong and I serve as Chief Academic Officer. Um, so I'm gonna, it's, a, it's a big overview. Um, there are even more detailed slides um, updated in the, or uploaded into the board agenda packet for February 7th. That's just an information item. Um, but what I want to do is talk to you about um, the work that we're doing around um, instruction. And one of the key things that I must say is that educational equity is, um, is our center. And the three things that I'll talk about is what we consider our roadmap to educational equity. And so um, that all, all that does is really um, um, put our focus on high quality teaching and learning um, for all students in every classroom. And the work that's needed to ensure that happens are the, the three key areas that I'll talk about. Dr. Armstrong, have you started your slideshow? Uh, uh, if so, I'm not seeing it. And uh... Uh, oh. Jordan, do I click on slideshow on the agenda? It looks like it's still loading. Is okay. it um, loaded on your end, it's, Dr. Armstrong? Yes. Okay. Um, 
maybe uh, if you could close it out and then um, reopen okay. if that's possible. For some reason, it got stuck on loading for the rest of us. Um, and, and I will share, uh, we've had some issues with Zoom over the past few days <laughs> with as we're, we're going to this format uh, at another community meeting. Do you guys see it now? No, mm, I do not. Okay, so maybe Jordan, I can I'll go. Yeah, I'll go ahead and. Sorry, thank yep. you. No, you're good. Yep, I have some leftover anxiety from the other night. <laughs> thank you for interrupting me, Roger, because I was just moving ahead and thinking you all were looking at these slides. So, I appreciate. Are you all it. able to see that? Yes. I, I yes. Don't see anything yet? You don't see anything yet, Roger? No. Do I click on slideshow? No, you shouldn't have to click on anything. You should just see the screen. All I see is this, uh, the porthole that says CBRC, meaning link to agenda. Okay. Sounds like most other folks are able to see it. Um, I can well, see it. Don't let me interrupt. Just keep going. Okay. If you can't, if anybody else can't see it or is having a hard time, let me know in the chat and I'll I'll keep an eye on that. And even just to make sure that the Zoom window is fully open. But um, OK, so next slide, Jordan. OK, so that's the roadmap that I was talking about with educational equity as our center and the three parts um, are, th are three key um, areas that we believe, if acted on, um, will further our goals to educational equity. Next slide. So just for context, there are four um, significant things that um, I would say first laid the foundation and then um, second helped move the work um, so that uh, we have some action happening across all of our sites. So the first one was the graduate profile and the strategic plan, really outlining what it is that um, we want for our graduates in those education educator essentials. Then came the instructional framework, um, which really centered on uh, four key areas, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, our implementation plan, which started this year, um, and then our continuous improvement cycle, which is all about planning, doing, uh, reviewing, studying our results, and then um, acting. Um, and so again, just at the heart of educational equity is eliminating gaps between the lowest and highest performing students, and then eliminating the racial predictability and disproportionality of student groups. Next slide. Thank you. So our what then, our what is um, the instructional framework. And um, this, I, I'm gonna spend some time talking through the instructional framework and why that is so significant um, to our work. Next slide. So our, our instructional framework answers um, um, questions that are what it, that are essential. Um, what does high quality, effective teaching and learning looks look like in Portland? And so, what is the instructional framework? Right, it's our district wide vision. I like to tell people it's it's the way it's the way that we frame the work, right, and it helps explain what it should look like, what it should sound like, um, common vocabulary, those instructional strategies. Um, it prioritizes the professional learning that's needed to support the instruction that's happen happening. And then it's our through line, right, across our conversations, across coaching, across learning. I would even say that that through line goes from the school board to the classroom and that everything that we do are is in alignment with um, one another. So that's what the instructional framework is. So how do we use it? So the instructional framework is um, 
essential for planning. It's for reflection. And when we go and walk through classrooms, it's something that we're able to utilize to um, be calibrated as a team, but then also give feedback to teachers. Um, in our professional learning communities, that's what PLC stands for. It's an opportunity to further discussion around instruction and um, provide some, some coaching where, where needed. Um, and it also drives school improvement plans and it really teases out those instructional priorities that need to happen across all of the schools. But what it's not is an evaluation rubric or tool. Next slide. So digging a little bit further into the framework. So what it looks like. So our framework has four key areas. The first one is grade level and standards align. Um, that's making sure that every single one of our students in all of our classes have access to materials that are um, appropriate, that are rigorous and at the level that they should um, um, be using uh, to meet standard. The second is about being um, culturally affirming and making sure that the instruction in the classroom affirms and honors the students um, in the communities that they're from. Um, it is really spotlighting the diversity that is in all of our Portland classrooms and, um, and, and really is there to uh, center individual student stories um, which kind of then ties directly into the deeply engaging part of it. And, um, and it, that part is about students and um, that the cognitive work that they're doing um, is supported by instruction and that they're interested, that the content is, is relevant and meaningful to their lives. You know, sometimes what we like to say is that you know, pulling in examples, local examples, and helping students um, make connections, real-world connections to what it is that they're learning in the classroom um, are some of those examples. And then the last part of it is data-driven, um, the quantitative and qualitative data that helps um, teachers then adapt and um, revise and even enhance um, their lessons based on the feedback that they're getting on where students are at. And so for each of our four areas, we have um, the focus area and the definition defined. You all see that in the bubbles. Um, and then there's the educator indicators. So those are those actions that um, educators um, should, should be taking and should be making on a daily basis. And then there's a student indicator um, section that talks about what students are doing, um, how they're showing up and how we're engaging them. Next slide. Okay, so um, how do we do all of that, right? Because that instructional framework, it's big. And it, the four parts um, it, it, the, to think Grade level standards align, culturally affirming, data driven, and deeply engaging, um, which is a new shift, right? With the um, formation of this instructional framework, means that we need to put some support in place. And that support comes in two ways curriculum adoption, so making sure that we have instructional materials that are relevant and in um, standards align. And then the second one is through teacher professional learning. Next slide. So the new curriculum, so I, I, I know that you all are no stranger to this. Um, so in 2020, the voters approved the school bond for new curriculum to make sure that all students had access to standards aligned and high quality instructional materials. Um, we are on track to implement new culturally relevant curricular materials um, for ELA and math at all grade levels. Um, and we are in the process of 
um, going through an, uh, an adoption for social studies and then science will be next, but social studies will be um, 23, 24. And maybe not K-12, but um, definitely we're in that process where we're currently reviewing materials. Um, the one um, tough thing is that um, when you look at the social study standard from the state of Oregon, um, not one vendor or publisher um, can meet all of those standards with a one book. So it's really taking us some time to dive into not only the textbook, that we're bringing forth, but the supplemental materials, because um, we really want students to be able to have access to um, current relevant um, social studies curriculum. And um, the last part is that um, all of our adoptions um, go through a review process, and that includes field testing by students and teachers. And so, like I said, for social studies, we do have um, a couple of um, materials that are in the field testing um, part right now. And then from there, we'll see um, what recommendations we get, but it is a rigorous detailed process. Next slide. Okay, and then the next one is the Align Teacher Professional Learning. So we are improving the ways in which um, we deliver professional learning for teachers. We're using um, research to um, support the shifts that we're making, and we're creating more opportunity for um, teachers to dive into the instructional framework, whether it's summer trainings, um, school staff meetings, or um, non-student days. Um, just today and yesterday, we had instructional framework walks where we were with a team of people visiting schools. I was at Grant High School all day today. I'm going into classrooms and collecting data on different parts of the framework. Um, and then we're also adopting a new teacher um, coaching model so that our, all of our teachers have access to an adult who can support them um, with instruction and give feedback in a non-evaluative way um, and to, to be their support person, their bridge, their link to help them deliver on our priorities that we've set. Next slide. Thank you. So it's just important to talk about, and we know what research says about change management and um, realizing that as we have shifted in the organization, so last year was the adoption for um, K-5 math, this year K-12, all ELA, and 6-12 math, and then next year social studies, and then shortly after we'll be looking at science, while also looking at some of those um, singleton classes, meaning those classes that, you know, might be only one class in the entire building, but they still need instructional materials. And what we know is that we know that there's an initiation and then there's implementation and then there's success. But along the way, there are some dips. And this slide just really speaks to um, staying on the line um, because sometimes when our educators take those off ramps, or those detours, like, oh, this is difficult. It's harder than I thought. I, I just need to stop. I need to take a break. That's when we begin to, to lose people. And so it does take time and we're staying the course as this is year two for the big shifts that we've made in Portland in the Office of Teaching and Learning. Next slide. So then just our, our next steps, um, we'll continue our learning walks. Um, um, this month in May, um, we're triangulating our data from our learning walks and instructional rounds. So instructional rounds are happening um, with principals and um, their area senior directors, their supervisors, getting into classrooms and having conversation about what they're seeing in terms of teaching. Um, we're evaluating our curriculum adoptions and looking at our data around professional learning and we're also 
um, ramping up our plans to support building leaders and teachers on the feedback that they're giving us and making sure that we're providing the support structures that um, that they want and that they need. And we're also improving our messaging around the instructional framework. We have posters go out um, last week to get into all of our buildings so that um, it's not just this thing that sits at the district office or on our website, but it's really um, a, a framework that we believe in and that um, if we're saying that we want it, we want our language to be common, then we need to make sure that it, it's um, on that through line to the classroom. Okay, next slide. Oh, that right. might be. And is this the last slide? Yeah, I was going to say that might be it. I, <laughs> I thought I had a question. Okay. I didn't have a questions one. Okay. So, um, so I guess what I'll just say, um, yeah, I think what I'll, my, my overall message um, would, will be that, you know, in the Office of Teaching and Learning, we have um, a pretty large department and we're structured in a way that, um, that allows us to keep the focus on instruction, that we center students and we center learning and we center support for teachers. Um, and all of our work and even our learning as a group is um, sitting as learners so that we can also have those conversations about what we need to do to improve as a group so that we can help the groups um, who need to improve. And that's, sorry, that's a lot. I feel like I, that was a lot of talking at you all, but I know I also have some time for questions. So um, what, what can I answer? Grace? Hello, thank you, Dr. Armstrong. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak to the, a little bit more detail about the instructional coaching, that, that, that shift and um, what that would look like at the elementary, the middle, and the high schools? Yeah, that's a great question. So we did announce to principals just a couple of days ago um, the support that we'll um, be providing so that all of our schools will have an instructional coach. We are in the process of working through that job description with HR and PAT. Um, but we do know that while the position will be um, localized site base, and when I say localized, I mean at the school site and centrally supported by the Office of Teaching and Learning, making sure that those coaches have the resources and materials that they need to um, support the instruction that's happening in the building. But like all parts of the details, I don't know if I can speak to just yet, as the job description is still um, under construction, for for lack of a better term. Will there just be one uh, instructional coach at each high school or will there be more than one? Because there's so many more um, academic, you know, deep understandings that are required at high schools and, and at middle schools. Um, yeah, I'm a teacher at an elementary school and I can, I can imagine a situation of having a, one instructional coach at an elementary school of manageable size yeah. It would still be a tall order for that one person to understand all of the curriculum at all the levels, but yeah. I'm having a hard time understanding how we would be able to find someone who could support all the learning that goes on in a middle school and a high school. Yeah, absolutely. So we still have content area experts that are on the team at OTL, and we also believe that um, a, a support structure, um, a teacher leader pipeline is something that we need to strengthen. Um, we don't believe that, um, you know, that there's a single person that's responsible for um, leading towards the instructional priorities, but that's a team of people. And we're still teasing out what that looks like. And um, in the process of creating or refining a model that speaks to what that support structure will look like. Um, so that could be, um, individuals who have a certain expertise in a certain subject area, um, on an instructional leadership team, on an IOT, um, that's coming together with the instructional coach 
um, to have conversations about work that's happening in those professional learning communities um, or other spaces that's focused on learning. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Karanja? Yes, thank you. Um, I have a few questions, um, but I asked these two in the beginning. So um, my first question is, how is the framework, this instructional framework, aligned with the PAT contract? And how is it um, aligned with the current evaluation of how teachers are evaluated? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it isn't right now. So the instructional framework um, came to be or under development, was under development last um, last year, I believe last spring, prior to my arrival. Um, and in the PAT contract, I believe the teacher evaluation um, system is more aligned to um, a framework that's um, the Charlotte Danielson, more aligned to like a Charlotte Danielson framework. Um, and while that talks about um, like planning and preparation and instruction and engagement and reflection, um, ours is more focused on um, uh, those instructional um, strategies that need to happen to engage learners. And we also like to think of it as our tier one, like this is the type of instruction that every student should have um, so that we know that um, it's our baseline, that the culturally affirming, deeply engaging, data-driven, and grade level standards aligned, um, but it's not um, tied to the PAT contract. Okay. Has PAT been involved in creating the framework? I would have to imagine. I know that there were teams. I, I don't know if I can speak directly to that. I don't want to misquote. Um, I don't know all who was on the team last spring. Um, but I do know that it was a group of individuals um, from central office and school buildings. And um, so, but I don't know like if PAT leadership was involved, but I do know that there were PAT members involved, but I know that that could be very different. So. Um, okay. Cause I'm asking because I know we're in bargaining right now um, and being a former uh, PAT member, um, when it's not involvement in place from the very beginning, it's going to be a lot of um, resistance. Yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering if there's going to be, uh, if there's collaboration from the very beginning, if that's going to be integrated into the new uh, bargaining contract um, that is uh, pending right now. Yeah, that uh, is certainly a conversation. And uh, I have other questions, but I'll, sure. I'll refer to my colleagues right now. Okay, I'll go to Roger and then I'll see, I'll come back. My question was, um, are your efforts uh, linked to uh, AP classes and uh, IBE, uh, uh, um, the International Baccalaureate Program uh, 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 courses? Uh, are they the same or, or are they, separate um well that so that all fits in the office of teaching and learning um where we have a b i p um sorry a p i b um and c t e on the instructional framework the instructional framework can be applied to um any classroom any level um across portland public schools um but we do have um, a concentrated effort on um, growing our, our programs, whether it is AP, IB, or CTE. I don't know if that answers your question directly, but, but I would just say that um, the instructional framework is for all classrooms, um, PK through 12. Okay, um, Stephen. Yeah, and so I think you there's an E there. I'm not listening. If you think A is just Um And it's not. No, it, it, you, you just read it. You read it. You don't care. Um, 
I just want to say, um, so I, I like this framework. Um, it, 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 uh, it resonates with me. And what I'm trying to kind of spare my mind is, you know, last time we talked about the, the goals, um, there's some pretty, um, there's some pretty, um, uh, uh, you know, um, strong goals in terms of um, reducing or narrowing uh, the cheating gap. Um, and they're, they're also quite quantitative, right? So there's, there's some sort of, you know, the annual percentage point gains to achieve these goals. And so I'm wondering how this framework connects to these goals or whether this is some sort of like a separate way to think about it. And I think the broader picture for me here is to think about, I think from this budget uh, meetings, and I think like maybe like the role uh, or like some sort of where I'm going with this is like, you know, if we, we were introduced to these goals and I guess what I'm trying to Figure out is like how a budget is going to be, um, you know, uh, set up in a way that allows us to realize these goals, right? And I think that that kind of connection is coming up here. Yeah. So, um, I think your your question is how are some of these actions going to help close achievement gaps? Right? Is that like a summary of it? Um, and I would say so. First. Um, taking the bold stance that we believe that every student should receive grade level standards aligned instruction or higher, depending on um, what course they're in, is a pretty bold statement. And, you know, we engage in conversations all the time with individuals who say, yeah, but I don't know if my kids are there yet, or, um, you know, I don't know if they're ready to go into that lesson just yet. So what's the other option? And we say that our only option is grade level standards align. You know, there's this quote that I often like to cite, and it's called the soft bigotry of low expectations. And when I think of many of our students who um, are, are experiencing um, or sitting in the, the gap, um, between um, high performing and um, and struggling, I think of those strategies that will help um, support them, right? So that productive struggle is something that's talked about in the instructional framework. The higher order thinking is something that's talked about. Um, the science of reading and, and um, having those scaffolds to support students so that, you know, if there is a student that's struggling with a specific concept or um, there's a, a specific skill that they haven't yet mastered, that there's scaffolds to be able to be targeted in that approach so that then that student can um, um, develop that skill or understand that concept and then um, continue on in their um, progression through the lesson. And, you know, we just believe that some of those elements are in all of the elements in our instructional framework, but some of the ones that I mentioned are those gap closing strategies. You know, oftentimes in organizations, you have folks, and I like to say that they're the ones who stand back and admire the gap, like, oh, we have an achievement gap, or we have an opportunity gap, and let's look at the data, and let's continue to have conversations about the data. Um, and I feel like that's admiring the gap. Um, what I'm hopeful for is um, coming out with an instructional framework about what we expect and prioritizing that um, is um, what I feel is that action towards um, actually closing those gaps and not just admiring it. So can I connect this follow up? Sure. I guess, I guess, yeah, so that, that makes a lot of sense to me. And I, I think I, I agree with you kind of the way you described that. I think what I guess what I'm missing is sort of like, you know, is, it, is there any, I guess, let me, let me ask you, maybe this part. Um, is there any evidence that adopting a, a framework like this leads to a change in achievement, in the reduction of achievement rates of that? Like, is there any hard evidence? And I'm not saying this because I think that should be the primary purpose of a framework. Yeah. Um, I'm just saying it because, right, um, the, you know, it's like when we formulate certain goals, or we agree or not with these goals, and then actions, right? Like we, I think we should think about how the actions connect to the goals. And yeah. Could, like maybe we need to rewrite the goals, right? Um, and, and we think about the goals. And maybe goals need to be more holistic and less quantitative. No, I appreciate that. And I can say, so one of the things is we know um, those ESSER funds that came in to um, really uh, mitigate learning loss 
um, was extremely impactful and powerful. And one of the um, strategies that we used was creating learning acceleration specialists where they would be pushed into schools and into classrooms, specifically math and English, um, supporting students, specifically Black and Native, because those are our students who, um, um, some of the, our students who needed some support. And we're seeing uh, some gains through our map testing, looking at that data. Um, that's the only data we have, like that, that, um, that slide I showed about the time and then just going through the implementation, but thinking of um, just those high impact uh, strategies to support le meet learners where they're at, um, give them some tools that they need and push them where we're seeing some promising results at um, getting students back at grade level um, in, in math and um, English language arts. And, and, and Dr. Armstrong, if I may just jump in real quick, thinking about um, uh, uh, Stefan's question and, and uh, um, it, it really is, I think about, um, I can't name the studies off the top of my head, but thinking about the importance of who's in front of the student uh, and, and the enabling conditions around the student. And, and when I kind of start taking the step back, I think about um, pedagogy, the art of teaching, uh, and then being a content expert. So someone could really know their material. You know, I, I, there was a point where I was, an un, I was a chemistry major. I knew chemistry. But if you have me teach it to someone, I may not be a good teacher. I may know the content expertise or vice versa. Someone may have a good pedagogy technique and how to engage and, and understand and differentiate, but maybe there's an opportunity to hone in on the on being an expert in how the math is is is, is understood. And, and so several studies talk about that that nexus of like the importance of having both and how do you create the conditions? How do you create the space to make that happen? And I think the instructional framework, which stemmed from the strategic plan. Uh, so thinking about all the community engagement, all the conversations that happened to build uh, forward together, right? It was the, the uh, Dr. Armstrong shared earlier, the, the graduate profile and, and the different dimensions and characteristics that we want our students to have as a PPS graduate. How are we going to get there? And, and one of the goals in the strategic plan was to develop the instructional framework, which then touches on like, how do we ensure that uh, pedagogy is there? How do we ensure that the content expertise is there, which touch on several studies and best practices, research back practices around improving uh, uh, student outcomes. Uh, so that, that and, 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 uh, and, and so, yeah, I just, Chimed in there. I was trying to be quiet. I'm fighting a cold, so my. <laughs> Me too. By the way, thank you. Uh, uh, reason why we don't have board member Lowry tonight is uh, her family has contracted COVID, so uh, <laughs> it, there's lots of disease going around. I guess. Uh, Stephen, your hand is still up. Uh, I don't know whether you intend to ask more questions. Okay, uh, are there other questions of Dr. Armstrong? We, we're, uh, we're right at 6.30, which was the, the time that uh, we were to uh, allow her to go on her merry way, but- um, looks, like, uh, um, looks like Karanja has hand up. Karanja, do you have another okay. question? Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, a lot of what you said in the presentation, um, we heard a few years ago with the CBC. Um, so I'm just curious, is, is the CBC still around? Um, has this replaced the CBC? Um, yeah, what, what is the update regarding that? The CBC, can you tell me what the acronym stands for? I think he's meaning the um, GVC, Guaranteed Viable Curriculum. Yeah, is GVC, right, excuse me. Yes, oh, GVC, okay. thank you for that. Yeah. Um... Well, I so the so the standards that um, that I'm referencing are the the Common Core standards, um, 
And I know at, at some point, some some folks, some individuals refer to him as GVCs. I don't I don't know if I know the history or well enough to. No, speak. that's that's we're talking about two different things. I know the standards. The okay. GVC um, was a, a, basically an instruction instructional framework that the superintendent presented. Okay. Um, so, but now we see this instructional framework. So I'm, I'm kind of confused. Is the GBC still in place or did that get replaced? Yeah, I would have to say that it got replaced because I haven't seen it. And the instructional framework, um, the roadmap to equity, educational equity is the only one I know. So, um, I'd have to ask someone on my team kind of <laughs> the specifics on that since it was pre me. Okay. Yeah. Is there anybody else on this call that can speak to that? That's aware of the GBC. I could speak to it as a classroom teacher. Um, this is Grace. As as a classroom teacher, the GBC was um, basically, you know, curriculum that was built in house through lots of hard work from educators and um, teachers on special assignment um, to meet the standards. And then I don't know exactly uh, the process of how that got pushed out mm -hmm. and um, new curriculum brought in, but I think it has something to do with that we had the money then to then go buy curriculum that was prepackaged. And so all those things that were created in house were then discarded and we bought curriculum from corporate vendors. That's concerning. Um, as a as a committee member, uh, I'm I'm gonna ask my colleagues to to look more into that, um, to see the effectiveness of the GBC, how much money was spent, and then if there's any allegations um, that is wants to be spent for this year for next year's budget regarding this framework. I just want to see a comparison of the the former uh, instructional framework, with the GBC, and, and this new one. And Karanja, I, I, this is the first time hearing GBC as well. So I, uh, I, I don't know how feasible that's going to be to go back. And depending on the records to Dr. Armstrong's point, like we'll probably have to have conversations with folks who may no longer be at the district. Uh, but I think certainly taking a look at it and just frankly speaking, if we take a look at our map and performance data, that's I, there may be some, you know, uh, inkling as to what that looked like over the past few years, uh, and with the latest present uh, presentation and information, we're hopeful for our next meeting we'll have Dr. Adams uh, join us to talk about the data, and and maybe we can ask to see if there's some data that can be pulled from uh, the past few years to kind of look at where trends have been. Uh, but it, it's a good conversation to have, and and really thinking about where we've been and, and where we're going and, and the why, to Karan, to your mm -hmm. point, like why, you know, why is this happening and being able to uh, explain that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think with us here on the folks, right, uh, second year in, uh, Dr. Armstrong, first year in, uh, it, we're, we're, we're uh, probably have to go look at the, uh, I, I want to say the archives and see what, what sort of information we can pull. I, I'll just, throw out there too. I've, I've, I've written down um, your comments, Karanja, and I'll make sure that um, we follow up. And um, I also do, I have been around long enough to know about GVC as well. Um, so I'm happy to help folks kind of dig out some information. I know there's a, a few big presentations from the 1819 school year. Um, so not too long ago. Um, but yeah, I, I've written it down and um, okay. We'll, we'll yeah, great. Thank you. Because I'll I'll just put up an email because uh, I had asked about that, and just last year it said that the GBC was still implemented, and that was uh, uh, Deputy Superintendent Margaret Carter, Mar Margaret Calvert, excuse me. Um, uh, yeah. So I'm I'm just curious of what happened to it, and and um, yeah. Yeah, and it could we we can certainly come back, and and it could very well be a conversation around like oh it's it's uh, it's a uh, thinking about the first time I've heard that acronym, so maybe just unpacking and having some conversations and come back and be like oh yeah that's what this is, and and being able to do that, so uh, I think it's a, certainly a, a follow up. 
Right. And, and okay. I, I, I would, the only other thing that I would add, thank you for what everyone else has said, is that um, we're still adopting curriculum. So I would have to think that there's still some um, teacher developed materials, like specifically in science um, and maybe some other areas. But yeah, I, I'll, I'll thank you for capturing those questions, Jordan, and I will um, see what I can add. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for the invite. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, no problem. Thank Have you a good very time. much, Dr. Thank Armstrong. You. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, next on our agenda uh, um, was a, a letter received by the community-based organization uh, uh, organizations about the student investment account funding. Uh, I uh, uh, forwarded that uh, or that letter uh, to uh, to Jordan and asked him to put it on the portal. And uh, and then the, just this afternoon, I also heard from uh, Tom De Jordan, uh, who um, uh, who is a spokesperson for them, uh, uh, associated with the Mount Scott uh, Learning Center. Um, uh, uh, further articulating uh, uh, information that they had received from uh, from uh, ODE, uh, the Oregon Department of Education, uh, uh, about student investment account funding, and um, uh, I don't know whether uh, uh, Noberto or, or or your staff uh, have had an opportunity to to look at that and. Uh, to uh, respond to it, uh, if if so, is that in our, uh, our on our portal of uh, Q and A, or uh, or do you want to want to share anything about it? If you if you, if it's something you haven't uh, looked at yet uh, and want to respond to later, that's that's fine. Just let us know. Yeah, no, th thank you, Roger. I, I think uh, what I can share is that uh, we're in the midst of developing our SIA plan. So the student investment account uh, planning cycle is ending this year and a new cycle is, is uh, we're developing the plan as we speak for the upcoming, not just the upcoming biennium, but like for the next four years. The student investment account is now part of a broader effort by the Oregon Department of Education known as a aligning to student success. So it's really looking at as I SIA measure 98, which is a high school success success act, there's CTE and a few other grants. And so ODE is uh, asking districts across the state to put together a comprehensive plan that's not just about SIA, but about all of these different other or uh, di distinct funding sources, but to treat them as a cohesive strategic plan, which makes sense. And, and that's the work we, we're starting to do as part of uh, some of our community engagement conversations. Uh, there was a survey that went out um, to families and, and community to get feedback around this. There was a presentation embedded in that as well. And so it's an ongoing process. We do have some preliminary numbers from the state uh, that the grant, the SIA grant is, is about $36 million. This year we had about $38 million, um, it's slightly higher, probably closer to 39. So it's still moving pieces. So it's still early in the game. We mentioned earlier that uh, the governor shared her budget you know, legislatures are working through different bills and they'll eventually be making appropriations. And part of that includes what that amount will be, uh, the SIA amount. But uh, it, it's, it's, it's in the process right now as we're working to put together our, um, our plan for the integrated grant. So it's an integrated grant guidance from Oregon Department of Education to get to aligning uh, for student success. I see uh, nope. Mariah has her hand. Yeah, I had a little bit of a hard time um, sorting through the the numbers on this. Um, just uh, maybe my lack of experience here. And so perhaps not for this meeting, but for a future meeting, I would like to come back to this and just ask the number of, so they put in about $27, $2,800 per student. 
and they're saying they have 900 students. That's clearly not what they're funding. That's not their sole funding source, right? This is supplemental Correct. funding. Okay. Correct. Yeah. And then, and it, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, I, and uh, I, I uh, there's the SIA as one additional one funding stream. There's uh, another one uh, that is uh, net based on the net operating calculation. It's a complicated calculation that adds additional funding. Uh, but yeah, there's there's additional funding sources there. Okay, thank you. That that helps a bit because they break it out as in terms of you know per student funding across the district, but it's clearly not going to all district students. So are we being asked to, as a, as a committee, weigh in on this specifically as a part of our recommendations later? Uh, they, they would like for us to weigh in. Um, uh, historically, um, charters and CBO, CBOs uh, and uh, uh, alternative programs are, are funded by a formula that comes from the state at 70% based on the average daily uh, attendance or membership as it's called ADM. And, um, um, and it's passed through the district to these, these organizations. And um, it, largely at the behest of these organizations, uh, CBRC has recommended to the board that they increase the, the 70%. And, and last year they, they, they they received ninety percent. Um, um, the um, uh, now this year, CBOs are are targeting on on this specific funding source of the from comes from the student success tax, and that's where they come up with these figures of twenty seven hundred dollars or or whatever, and um, uh, uh, and and so. Uh, it's up to us whether we make, recommend. Uh, uh, there are certain services that are provided by the district to these organizations, and uh, um, there's a, a, a calculation of administrative uh, uh, cost that uh, the district takes, and uh, and and so on. So uh, uh, Berto can uh, give us a, a more detailed briefing uh, as we go along, but um, that, in a nutshell, is that the the uh, they asked me the other day to come tour one of their facilities, which happens to be right in my own neighborhood. So I, I went over and walked through the building with them. Uh, but uh, uh, they're obviously wanting us to recommend to the board that uh, uh, they they get their uh, what they see as their fair share of the student investment account. So. Karanja has his hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I had a question about, um, will we be able to review like any outcomes from these community-based organizations? Um, like what type of uh, success and, and uh, outcomes do they have? Would that be presented? That, that, that's a responsibility of the charter and, and the alternative program uh, subcommittee of the board and they review uh, performance uh, 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 and that is not a, a role that we play. Um, Roger, though, in, in, in regards to that, um, one aspect is like we're not, CBRC is certainly not reviewing, um, but it may be helpful information. Um, so I, I don't want to take it off the table if if folks are interested in seeing well, information. Well, I, I, I don't want I don't want to make it. I do want to make it clear that it is not our role to review whether right. they're performing right. or not performing. That is a decision right. made by the board uh, subcommittee. We're welcome to yes, review right. what yep. the board has acted on uh, with regard to these organizations, but that's not okay, our yep. role. Yep. Okay, I, I didn't. I don't. Uh, I didn't. I didn't say um, to like we're making a decision. I said it's data presented. It's data information presented. I didn't. I didn't talk about a decision making. Yeah, I don't yeah. know who you're talking and, about. And, and Karanja, the, 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 I'll I'll chime in to say that that's one of the reasons why I monitor uh, subcommittee meetings and board meetings 
because decisions are made throughout the year by the board, whether they recognize it or not, that establishes policy that dictates to the, the superintendent how to construct his budget. And um, so uh, reviewing a, the performance of a charter uh, or, or a alternative program uh, uh, is one of those instances. Uh, the policy committee is another one. Um, uh, audit committee is another one, uh, and, so, and so on. And uh, so uh, if, if you have the time to go back and review, uh, you know, all those uh, meetings are on, on online, uh, posted online, if you, if you can't attend them uh, in person. Uh, but uh, I would encourage uh, committee members to get their, uh, themselves put on the public notice uh, um, uh, uh, list. Uh, so you're receiving the notices of these meetings and so on. So um, you're aware that when they take place. I see uh, Stephen has his hand up. Yeah, uh, just to make sure, like it's it's Stephen who is made uh, up for the speech to maybe uh, let me continue. But um, I um I would just wanna so uh, if I understand this correctly, this was also to on this point. It's like so we're supposed to. I think what we're supposed to do is to say we can recommend this. Is that correct? I'm sorry, Stefan, but uh, I have a difficult time understanding. Uh, uh, I don't know, maybe the sound uh, on my machine, but uh, uh, what was your question? So I just want to make sure like our, what, what we are tasked to do here is our task to, to say, to fix and go like a recommendation for this or not. We will review the proposed budget as to whether or not it aligns with the board's goals and vision. Uh, okay. And... So yeah. Okay, thank you. I think that's enough. So if it if if you wanna if you're supposed to see where this aligns with the goals and visions, the goals and visions are quantitative. I don't see anything here that can tell me whether this can um help us in the goals and visions. So I can't make a decision as to what can be on this. Well, we we don't yet have a proposed budget in front of us to to know whether the he's proposing to paint buildings green or pink or something, or whether he's uh, uh, aligning himself with the goals of the of the board. And um, I, I see Grace's hand up, and uh, and. I'll, I'll just something regarding not just from the CDL perspective, just I think when we take a look at the universal budget is is really thinking about um, the board goals, a strategic plan and and what I share with folks, uh, what, you know, whether they like to hear it or not like to hear it at the end of the day, it's a pie, not a well. So having to prioritize, there's only so much funding to be able to do all the variety of different things. And so when we align towards uh, the objectives of the board and, and, and um, how, how is then the superintendent's uh, proposed budget aligned towards the board goals and the strategic plan. And so knowing that there's limited funds, how are we um, making the best uh, balance approach there? Grace, I, I, I jumped in. You had your hand up. I just wanted to um, clarify, uh, Stefan, you were asking whether or not um, you were sharing that you didn't feel that you had enough information at this point to endorse the letter. Is that correct? You weren't talking about the whole budget. That's correct. I, I would say uh, yes. And let's say, I would say it's just, uh, just slightly different, like um, I don't have enough information to, to uh, be able to, to make a recommendation. Right. So uh, if, you I, know, I, don't, I don't think that's <laughs> the intent tonight. Uh, uh, it was to acknowledge receipt of it and, uh, and that uh, for further analysis will be required. I, I would also um, want to throw out that 
as of a couple of days ago, the district is no longer offering an online learning academy. They've closed that school um, as part of their, their plan. And so I think that this letter from the CDOs, which tend to support students who have been unsuccessful um, in getting their needs met in, an, in a traditional school setting, um, becomes even more uh, important to listen to because that other option of having an online school is no longer available to those students. Um, so I would like to see more data as well about the effectiveness of these programs, but also just to share with the committee my concerns of making sure there are plenty of opportunities for students to, um, to be successful, no matter the whether it's in a traditional school or in a CBO, that, that, that that's important. Yeah, th thank you for bringing yeah, that. Uh, that's a good point. And I was gonna say, maybe the staff can provide us the, the list. I, I think there are something like, something like 10 or 14 uh, CBOs uh, in, in all of what they are and what their individual focuses are, are uh, uh, very uh, so. Uh, that's in all information that we could benefit from having. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll chime in. Uh, the Online Learning Academy, to be clear, still open for this year, and, and a decision was made to close the program for next year. Um, in uh, their staff that's going to be working and work and currently working with families to ensure whether it's our virtual scholars program or whether it's their neighborhood school or whether it's some other option that can support them. And the Online Learning Academy uh, was funded through ESSER. So it was one-time funding uh, that was supporting the program. Uh, relate, it was a response to the pandemic. And as, as enrollment has dwindled down from a high of about 600 students to about 230 students, and when we're thinking about the one-time dollars that our ESSER are going away, it's having to make that decision, but definitely working with the families to support them and identifying appropriate options that, that work for them. Grace, your hand is still up. If there are no other questions, um, I would encourage um, individual committee members to submit questions uh, for staff uh, to, to uh, respond to uh, and, um, uh, and uh, open to anybody who wants to add uh, any comments uh, at this time. Uh, um, so I'll, I'll shut up for a minute and see what what others want want to say. Mariah. Yeah, um, I think I'd ask uh, through email a question regarding um, the budget process and just if you don't have an answer right now, that's fine. But um, there was some answer shared in email. Um, regarding where we are with the survey and um, kind of expectations for the engagement process. How do you feel it's going this year? Yeah, I, I uh, we were thinking of putting a presentation to share uh, and talk through it today, but we definitely want to give this space to Dr. Armstrong. Uh, but it, at some point, maybe whether at our next meeting or, or via an email response, um, it, it's, uh, we, we wrapped up our last community engagement uh, earlier this week with our special, ed, uh, special education families. And uh, since December, meeting with a variety of different groups throughout the past few weeks, and uh, it's been better than last year. We've had lots of responses to the survey as well. And a lot of this information, I think it's over 600 responses to the survey. I, I, I think it's, it's a, a good response. Obviously, uh, 45,000 students 
<laughs> there's a disproportionality there, especially for you know our uh, statisticians, and when we start looking at that. But uh, it's it's one component to the process that you know we're going to leverage on top of uh, some uh, additional ongoing conversations that have been happening with our school leaders and other stakeholders. And a key driver to this is the integrated grant. Uh, application that we're working on that I mentioned earlier that the state of Oregon is requesting us to put together a cohesive plan that's been um, uh, informed whether through community engagement or best practices. And so uh, we we're in the midst of compiling all that information. Um, I don't off the top of my head, I don't know how many uh, sessions we've done, uh, but <laughs> It, we, we've made the rounds, <laughs> had a, a few conversations, seven sessions, uh, and I think from the perspective of, of of an intentional effort from the CFO's office, an intentional effort to try to help uh, not just relay what a budget is and what a strategic plan is, but also to collect insight. Uh, I'm very, very happy with the results and very proud of the team as well. <laughs> Give a huge shout out to Jordan and to Alexandra, uh, who uh, <laughs> lots of late evenings uh, and, and getting through a lot of the information. But uh, we'll definitely come back and, and share some more information, particularly as we work towards putting the application together that we'll, we'll need to submit to the board that they'll then approve that goes to um, ODE, the Oregon Department of Education. So are All there right. other questions? Uh, yeah, I just I, I just have um, some questions I just want to put on record, and you don't have to answer today, but I just wanted to put it on record, and um, maybe you guys can answer these questions uh, another time. Um, so the first question is, um, how does the district plan on using the successful school survey data? Um, will that survey data be available to the communities? How has the district used the data from this survey in the past? And what examples does the district have to show the impact of the survey on investments and outcomes in the current year and the previous year? And I will put that question in the chat. <clears throat> Next question I want to put on record is, how is the budget survey data going to be used in regard to integrate grant guidance? How would this survey data feedback be used to inform the budget and invest decisions internally? And will that survey data be available to communities? And the last question is in the current budget process, uh, planning process, has the district re-evaluated grandfather programs, investments like 15 years plus, such as AVID? Um, what is the current cost of each program and investment? How many students do each of these programs serve? What is the demographics of these programs? And what is the success rate? And then also, um, have these programs been compared to new programs, investments like um, the RESJ contracts to reflect the effectiveness and the return on investment. And I will ask a lot of questions there. So I will put that in the chat and hopefully you guys can answer those uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. I think Berto, in, in many ways, uh, some of those questions uh, um, reflect some, some of the concerns that uh, I have raised in the past. Uh, 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 the district has uh, put forth uh, resources for over the last five decades uh, uh, trying to deal with the what we call the education gap. and. Um, there and and yet the gap still exists and uh, and so uh, uh, is there an ongoing evaluation as to uh, the effectiveness of of uh, the resources that have been put forth uh, 
uh, uh, previously and uh, whether they should continue and are, are should be altered in some way. Yeah, I, I think that uh, it's the, uh, I don't know, if you account for inflation, the billion dollar question that uh, districts across the country ask themselves when it just gets to academic return on investment, right, and, and the ability to uh, account for the merits of one program or another. And I think that's something that is on top of mind, particularly as um, we're rolling out um, a, a dashboard that talks to our progress against our strategic plan and, and the goals there. That's something that um, we can share a link to it in, in one of our Q&A sessions, but, or in our Q&A document, in that opportunity to evaluate programs. And it, it is one of those uh, challenges where you think about like the layered cake, there's something that's been happening, then you add another layer on top of it, how do you assess when to stop and not stop? And those are some of the conversations that we've started. And 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 and, and, and to be able to say, are we? How do we compare Avid to RestJ? We haven't done that, and I don't know to what capacity we may be able to do that. Um, but I think there are certain uh, evid examples of responding to survey data. Uh, responding to uh, different elements. I think about the, the increased investment in social workers through the student investment account that came out of some, some feedback conversations. Um, and, and so we'll, we'll definitely formulate an answer. And, uh, it's, it, it, and the reality of it is not going to be a perfect answer. And I can think of experiences in other places where it's like, oh, well, why did that one program work great at this one school, let alone different districts? But it's like one school did better, similar demographics than another school, and it could be a variety of different reasons, uh, whether it's technical to just adaptive and, and, and the levels there. So there is no real easy way that anyone's put on paper that we can say, yes, that is the formula. That is exactly the route we need to go. Uh, but but we're keenly aware of it and, and thinking about the the information that Dr. Armstrong shared, there's when we, when we look at the data and we think about the, the immediate impact that, that the immediate opportunity, the opportunity for immediate impact is like the teacher in front of the student and then the principal in the building. And so what are then like, how do you then provide those relevant uh, resources and benefits? And then you, how do you wrap it around? the students so whether it's counselors or social workers or other services and and so yeah it, it becomes an extremely complicated puzzle so roger i don't have a clear answer but are, are we thinking about it and, and like how are we moving forward with our our plan so with the uh, integrated grant guidance it's a four-year plan that ode is asking us to put together and so as we collect information it's also not just about an immediate response for next year. It, it really is what are the, the, the shifts and pieces we can be putting in place as we build towards the next few years. And, and yeah, there's just that real conversation back to it's a pie, not a well. There's limited number of resources. How do we make thoughtful decisions around what to stop, what to continue? Okay, um, are there any other questions? Uh, Karanja has already left us this evening and uh, I, I wanna be sure to thank everyone for their participation this evening. Um, uh, there's been some good questions and uh, I'm sure there'll be uh, further questions uh, uh, that uh, will be forthcoming from the, the committee uh, as well. But um, uh, is there a, uh, Anything else uh, anyone would like to uh, uh, ask at this time? And uh, if so, please raise your hand so we can recognize you. If not, um, uh, Jordan, will you please remind us when our next meeting is? And uh, uh, is it the joint uh, work session with the board on the 14th or, or, or do we have another meeting? Um, yes, one of these times I'll actually have that up. 
um, <laughs> when you asked me the question. Um, March 2nd is our next C CB regular CBRC meeting, um, Thursday, March 2nd. The, the board work session that um, we were referring to earlier is on the 14th of March, which I'm about to send you all an email asking if you can come in person. And if you can, I need to know if you have dietary restrictions. So, but please respond to that email when you get it. And that's what I put in the chat there. So, uh, so we're, we will meet again on March 2nd uh, at the uh, regular time of, of uh, 1530 or, or 530 in uh, civilian time. And um, um, if uh, there's no uh, further questions, uh, we stand adjourned. Thank you, everyone.